Welcome to the IDKD Refresher Series on Musculoskeletal Diseases. I'm going to be showing a complication following ACL reconstruction in the knee. My name is David Rubin. I'm a musculoskeletal radiologist in the United States. And as you can see from these uh, photographs, I really miss being in Davos this year. This patient is a 52-year-old woman who had an ACL reconstruction two years ago. Initially, she did well and returned to full activity after 10 months. One year ago, she developed pain and swelling in the anterior proximal leg, and about one month ago, developed activity-related pain immediately. On physical exam, her knee is stable with a full range of motion, and she has tenderness along the medial joint line and anterior to the proximal tibia. These are her coronal fat-suppressed T2-weighted images from posterior to anterior, and the first thing I'll point out is there is her graft in the intercondylar notch. Now we want to determine whether the graft tunnel position is appropriate or not. If we consider the intercondylar notch uh, as a clock, then the normal femoral tunnel belongs at either the 11 o'clock or 1 o'clock position, depending if we are looking at a left or a right knee. So in this case, this one is normal at the 1 o'clock position. Inside her tunnels, we can see that she has bioabsorbable interference screws. Notice they have less artifact than the typical metal screw. We also have this artifact on the outside of her femur, which is due to an endo button, and that's an important clue to what type of graft she probably had. The two most common uh, graft types are illustrated here. This is a bone patellar tendon bone autograft. We can recognize that by seeing the bone plug harvest sites in the patella and proximal tibia, and sometimes seeing those plugs within the tunnels next to those metal interference screws. The second common type is going to be a hamstring autograft, which is what our patient had. In this case, the tendon is going to be doubled or quadrupled and run through the femoral and tibial tunnels, secured often by an endo button on the femoral side and a screw or staple on the tibial side. Inside the tunnel, there may be interference screws that are plastic or biabsorbable and thus are not visible on the radiographs. You wanna make sure you look for tunnel widening and measure it in its maximum diameter perpendicular to the long axis of the tunnel. Widening is not necessarily abnormal uh, and it doesn't necessarily mean that the graft has failed, but if the graft has failed, the surgeon wants to know that because it's gonna affect the revision procedure. Uh, the graft, if it's wide, may need to be uh, bone grafted in a two-step operation. In this particular case, when the surgeon revised this uh, failed ACL, they used an extra wide interference screw to fill that femoral tunnel and then supplemented the operation by a reconstruction of the extra articular anterior longitudinal, I'm sorry, anterior lateral ligament. Uh, we have two other abnormalities that we're going to come back to on the coronal images, this bone marrow abnormality in the posteromedial tibia, and this soft tissue abnormality along the anterior edge of the tibia. On the sagittal images, these are T1-weighted images. We want to again assess our tunnel position. The simplest way to do that is to identify the roof of the intercondylar notch or Blumensatz line. The tibial tunnel should be just posterior to that, so this one is normal. The femoral tunnel also belongs just posterior to the superior part of Blumensatz line. Now, this image is through the center of the knee, so we need to translate that line onto the lateral part of the uh, femoral condyle, and now we can see where that tunnel exits the femur in the correct position. Non-isometric tunnel position can be a problem for a few reasons. This example, the femoral tunnel is at the 12 o'clock position. And if we look at the tibial tunnel, it's well posterior to Blumensatz line. That combination means that the graft is gonna be relatively vertically oriented, and that can lead to graft laxity or even rotational instability. Uh, this patient, the femoral tunnel is too far anterior and superior, and clinically this patient had a lax graft, even though it looks perfectly normal on the MRI. In the arthroscope, that graft was lax, uh, incompetent, and needed to be revised. So we can't always determine graft laxity on MRI, but we can accurately look at the tunnel position. Another problem with tunnels is if they're too far anterior, 
In this example, there's Blumensatz line and there's the femoral tunnel well anterior to Blumensatz line with surrounding osteolysis. Remember, it belongs back there. In the second example, the tibial tunnel now is anterior to Blumensatz line. And this anterior tunnel position can lead to graft impingement along the roof of the intercondylar notch and eventually to graft rupture. If we go back now to our patient on the proton density weighted and T2 weighted images, we can look at the signal of the graft. When the graft is very low in signal intensity, that's a good indicator that the graft fibers are intact. A few foci of high signal uh, paralleling the long axis of the graft is normal, uh, especially in a hamstring graft where that may be between the different fibers of the graft. And you need to be careful about graft signal early on. Uh, in the first year when the graft is undergoing synovialization, it can often be quite high signal intensity, as you can see here, with this high signal surrounding the intact graft uh, fibers. This patient was about a year and a half after their initial operation. They underwent a second operation for another reason, and at that time, this graft was confirmed to be stable and intact. What does a graft rupture look like? Well, acutely, it's fairly simple because we're going to have a fluid-filled gap between the graft uh, fibers. And if it's a hamstring graft, you may actually see unraveling of those separate bundles. And that's something that we can see and correlates with what's going on in the arthroscope. Chronically, it can be more difficult. The most common finding is simply absence of any recognizable graft fibers. You wanna confirm that on the other uh, imaging planes as well. You won't necessarily have a fluid filled gap. If you do have lateral compartment bone contusions, that's a good indicator that the patient is unstable and has undergone a recent episode of giving way. Another complication to look for on the T2 weighted images in the sagittal plane is going to be a cyclops lesion. This is a focal synovial based mass of arthrofibrosis anterior to the graft. It can result in limited extension and you can see in the arthroscope why that's called a cyclops lesion. We have this eye type structure staring at the arthroscopist and once that's debrided behind it can see the normal ACL fibers. Arthrofibrosis can also extend into Hoffa's fat pad, uh, what we call an anterior interval lesion, as you see in these two patients. Uh, both have small cyclops lesions, but in addition have this very low signal intensity band of fibrotic tissue along the posterior aspect of Hoffa's fat pad, extending to the patella. And the patient on the right, we can see that the patella is actually retracted inferiorly. We have patella baja, and this can be another cause of limited extension and required debridement. So I think we're finally able to now go back and diagnose our patient. Remember, one of the findings was this soft tissue mass anterior to the tibia containing some sort of foreign material. If we look at the T2 weighted images, we can see part of the interference screw is sitting within the tunnel and the tunnel looks normal, but where it exits the anterior cortex of the tibia, we have this inflammatory mass anteriorly and it's surrounding these fragments, uh, which are part of that biabsorbable screw. And this is what's called a pretibial cyst. Now this is an uncommon complication after ACL reconstruction. It occurs after one to three years. Uh, it may or may not be symptomatic with a mass or a painful mass. Sometimes this is an extension from a tunnel within the uh, uh, cyst within the tibial tunnel, and that may be due to lack of uh, graft integration or graft motion, bone necrosis or joint fluid that's extending along the long axis of the tunnel. Uh, in most of these cases, the graft is going to be functional and stable. When it's not associated with a tibial tunnel cyst, uh, it may be due to a sterile foreign body reaction due to that screw or even to the sutures, or it may be related as in this case to an extruded or fragmented tibial screw. While infection is theoretically possible, that has actually not been reported as an etiology. And the treatment is debridement of the soft tissue mass with or without uh, the bone tunnels and bone grafting if necessary. Some of these cysts really are purely cystic, as we can see in this other example. Here we see the entire screw is located within the tibial tunnel and undergoing resorption. Uh, in other cases like this, we have the cyst anteriorly, which is clearly a continuation of a cyst from within the tibial tunnel. Notice that this does not communicate with the joint, and that means it's safe to go ahead and just to breathe the tunnel without revising the actual graft. Then the final uh, abnormality in this patient, recall that she also had developed pain in the posterior proximal 
uh, medial leg, and this is going to be a medial tibial stress fracture. The way we recognize this is by referring to our T1-weighted images, which are, are most specific for marrow abnormalities, and seeing this low signal intensity stress fracture lie. So in conclusion, this patient has an intact ACL reconstruction graft in near isometric position. There's no arthrofibrosis or cyclops lesion. She has a pretibial cyst that's associated with fragmentation of that bioabsorbable interference screw, but no cyst within the tibial tunnel, and then has a stress fracture of the medial tibial plateau. If anyone is interested, here's a few citations uh, talking about those pretibial cysts. And I thank you all for your attention.